thing thing started uh okay so it is uh started look at uh, guys can you see the screen can you see my cursor yeah 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 it's moving all right uh perfect mm -hmm, yeah i hope there's no background noise guys no 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 that yeah no right like, no. uh, perfect up okay i will then uh get started uh well today we're going to just summarize quantum mechanics uh so to give you a preview of uh, what we're going to be doing we're going to talk about the basic aspects the most uh, foundational ideas in quantum mechanics uh and we're going to do it in the, the the context of quantum foundations which is uh what quantum foundations being the study of what does quantum mechanics mean uh, in relation to the world uh, by itself uh, and uh, we're not going to be doing too many examples uh, in fact as you'll see we've sort of uh, truncated ourselves to principles and uh, entanglement uh, rather than going over the usual time order such as the infinite square well or the hydrogen atom and so on uh, we just want to get straight to the content it'll be rather like an overview uh, but i will do my best uh, to provide some rigorous uh, uh, mathematical backing to the statements that i'm making and uh, so will mukun so to give you an idea of the structure i'm going to first motivate what is quantum mechanics why we study it and uh, how it came about in the first place um, and then i'm going to be uh, talking a bit about the mathematics uh, that stands behind it uh, which will be followed by the, the four postulates of quantum mechanics uh, uh, and then Mukun will proceed to talk about spin um, and entanglement and then I'll have a short uh, discussion about what's wrong with quantum mechanics and uh, what's happening right now uh, in the field of quantum foundations and uh, what we are going to be doing uh, for the next couple of uh, weeks or so uh, just uh, as a preview of the coming weeks. Uh, so without uh, further ado, I'll uh, get started. So when I say the word uh, quantum mechanics, or QM in short, um, well, quanta is a very uh, specific word and mechanics is something that's broadly used in different contexts but essentially what we're trying to do is we're looking at a particular scale we're looking at a particular uh, length scale uh, so the quanta here actually means scale and we're trying to talk about the dynamics or uh, which is to say how uh, nature behaves uh, when something uh, uh, happens in response to something or just by itself uh, which is just time evolution with evolving by itself with respect to time uh, so this is uh, what quantum mechanics is and the the motivation for studying this is it's it's pretty simple by print by the principle of reductionism which uh, underlies quantum mechanics and most of modern uh, theoretical physics uh, is that we are trying to reduce ourselves our, our study of nature to the smallest and smallest of indivisible uh, and categorizable uh, ideas or models and we're trying to understand these models we're trying to understand the consequences of these models at the smallest and smallest scales and quantum mechanics is uh, perhaps one of the greatest theories of the 20th century uh, in the sense that it provided reductionism a strong backing the philosophy of reduction a strong backing by saying that hey you know going deeper and deeper digging deeper and deeper actually does bring you surprises and uh, it, it, it shot it so this this is why we study it essentially because we believe that the world uh, can be sliced down to smaller and smaller things and these smaller smallest things govern uh, the dynamics of the large scale objects and they actually reveal the truth about the physical world around us uh, so this is the motivation for studying quantum mechanics 
and uh, this is apart from the um, <laughs> applications that you can make out of it, like nuclear fusion, or uh, you know, there are so many wide variety of applications. But this is the core uh, theoretical reason as to why we want to know uh, about this thing in nature. I will now walk you guys through a little bit of history. I would not say this is purely harness because I will be omitting various people, various characters in this story uh, for the sake of simplicity. Uh, but uh, what I feel is that this gives a rather lucid uh, starting to one of the most core ideas, the two of the most core ideas in quantum mechanics. Right? So the two ideas that we will be seeing here are as follows. The first principle is quantization and the second idea is uh, duality uh, and it, it, to be specific here it's uh, wave particle uh, duality. Well it's just that the idea is very simple uh, you know energy itself is quantized quantization applies to energy is the idea as an overview and uh, waves and particles uh, you know same way of looking at quantum mechanical things so this is the idea this is the core principle that we're trying to uh, I'm, I'm trying to sort of walk you through in terms of this historical review and I'll start at once uh, at the very end of the 19th century, what happened was there was this huge uh, issue with the uh, black body spectra. Well, essentially, they were trying to find uh, their, uh, the open challenge uh, that was given by uh, Kirchhoff uh, was Kirchhoff suggested find uh, U, which is for an arbitrary metal or for an arbitrary element, uh, uh, you know, what's the absorption emission, uh, what's the emission uh, spectra, which is if I induce uh, light uh, at a particular uh, wavelength and the object is at a particular temperature, what happens to the, uh, the uh, emission spectra? And uh, to find a general equation for this was pretty difficult. Uh, in fact, U of uh, lambda, I think, was found by Rayleigh and Jeans. Um, in fact, Rishi wrote an article about it. We'll link it in. Uh, so there's a very rigorous derivation. There's some nice neat bit of math, and it's tightly related to statistical mechanics. And in fact, uh, quantum mechanics did come from statistical mechanics. Um, so essentially, the idea was to find uh, and explain, uh, fly, find a function that uh, uh, fit this uh, radiation curve. Uh, the issue was, uh, it was essentially like a very weird bell curve. The, uh, the, the models that was in existence sort of diverged around this area. So someone needed to figure this out at this range at, or at higher frequencies. And uh, this is where uh, Planck enters the story. Uh, Planck says, here's the equation. This is it. And it does fit this distribution perfectly, absolutely perfectly. Um, but the assumption uh, Planck made was as follows. Uh, energy transfer is induced by quantized or quantized uh, linear harmonic oscillators. So these linear harmonic oscillators, the way they work is they don't just continuously transfer energy, but rather uh, these uh, linear harmonic oscillators uh, sort of give packets or they transfer energy in bunches, you know. That was the idea. The energy transfer is in bunches and these bunches were called for quanta later on. Uh, and uh, these linear harmonic oscillators are what he con considered to be molecules. So these molecules are transferring energy uh, in, in, in a quantized fashion. That was the assumption that he made. And uh, that assumption paid off and it gave him the right result. But uh, he couldn't 
really explain the idea thoroughly because he didn't believe it. He didn't believe that energy transfer could be quantized because, well, in fact, nature itself is uh, very continuous in most cases, and what we observe at the scales we observe. Um, so he didn't believe it. Uh, and in fact, uh, he would take someone else to come into the game and actually explain uh, why it was quantized. And uh, the answer was rather simple. Uh, we enter what's called the uh, uh, photoelectric effect, which was first observed by this guy called uh, Philip uh, Leonard, if I'm not wrong, and uh, explained by our very favorite Albert Einstein. Uh, the, the, the cool thing about Einstein is that he he was he was a guy who sometimes would just pick up an idea and run with it, even if the trend was kind of against it. Uh, that's kind of what he did with special relativity. He picked up uh, Maxwell's idea that the maximum speed an object can go at in C, and he ran with it and he got the right theory. Um, and here again, uh, he picks up on uh, Planck's idea. He picks this idea of quantized linear harmonic oscillators, and he actually uses it to explain uh, Leonard's uh, observations, which is what exactly happened was this was the experimental setup. So uh, essentially, there's a metal plate here, there's a metal plate here, there's, there's just vacuum, uh, and there's some uh, gas of some substance here, vacuum plus some just, just one particular gas, I mean. And what uh, essentially uh, Leonard did was he, sh he had sort of uh, shined uh, light here. I'm sorry, th there's no gas, it is vacuum. But he, he had essentially shined light here, and um, um, he observed this curve that it's only after a certain amount uh, uh, does the current actually start flowing and it actually saturates at a particular level and uh, this was the curve that uh, sort of had to be um, explained and uh, what Einstein did was uh, he basically assumed that this happens by means of uh, quantized particles called photons that are actually, so these photons come and hit, knock the electrons off, and then, you know, this was then later taken up by Compton, and it's called the Compton effect, uh, that's a completely different thing. But essentially what he did uh, was as follows. He explained that this is the equation, and it's quantized, but this, the, the, the difference, the distinction that Einstein uh, from Planck was uh, very, very subtle, is he said that, Energy transfer isn't quantized. Energy itself is quantized at that scale. That was his idea. So his idea was at the scale that we're looking at in terms of molecules and atoms, you know, or at quantum mechanical scales, energy itself uh, is quantized. So it's it's more of a stronger statement than Planck. And it, I'm saying here yet again. Uh, taking something serious, even even if its own originator did not believe in it, <laughs> uh, but running with it, and uh, this is what he got. So, and uh, again, uh, Einstein is a very good example of thinking from first principles and through uh, thought experiments. On a side note, uh, so that's how he got here. So it's uh, it's not just taking someone seriously and running with it. it w I don't think it will help you in today's world because there are too many ideas. But uh, essentially, that's what he did, and it worked out for him in 1905, and uh, that year was also termed a miracle year because he published some brilliant papers. But anyway, so this, effectively what it does, these two ideas uh, kind of establish that uh, matter and light, because that's what we were concerned about most up until the 50s or 60s, until QCD popped in, uh, matter and light are quantized, or are quantum mechanical particles, they are they are particles at the end of the day, they are not waves. And it was a rather strange statement to say this about uh, light because you had the double slit uh, experiment that was already telling you that, uh, you know, light was made out of waves and I uh, just to recap a little bit about what the double slit experiment, yes? Someone wants to add something? Okay, I'll carry on. Uh, but um, essentially, uh, you know, the idea of the double slit was if you take a coherent light source and you pass it through two slits, you get uh, 
a rather pattern like this is what you get um, and you would not get this with particles you would just get a rather really random you would just get randomness you would not have you would not see this sharp peak over here because uh, this essentially happens due to superposition of uh, waves so this is the idea behind the double slit and uh, people had almost forgotten about this because you know this was the this was now this became the trend uh, trends change quite quickly uh, as it should be because experiment has shown to be so but still this one guy uh, in his PhD thesis uh, put up this hypothesis that uh, the wavelength uh, I mean I, I mean sorry uh, he, he said that m there are these uh, uh, matter waves is what he said he said that you know matter itself must contain wave esque or wave like properties and they will be governed by this equation where p is the momentum i've just added this absolute sign to be careful with the sign of momentum with respect to the reference frame but uh it's, it's a bit big rather but this was this was wild uh this was uh opposite to what the trend was at the time even though he was very much in agreement with the double slit and when uh, they did the double slit with electrons they found something similar out when they did it with photons they found something similar out they found the same distribution popping up again and again so they wanted to settle the matter once and for all and um, they did this uh, davidson germer experiment which is done by these two people davidson germer uh, two different teams actually did the same did similar ex experiments uh, so essentially shooting electron beams and observing their scattering uh, and also measuring their scattering angle. Um, so essentially what they found uh, was the scattering wasn't as random as they thought. Because if it was just particles bombarding another particle, you would not see a preferential angle at which the amplitude is maximum. But that is exactly what they saw. They, they, they had a preferential angle which was I think 50 degrees. Um, and this was in perfect agreement with De Broglie's hypothesis and it also when you do some uh, back of the envelope calculations with uh, the Young's double slit, uh, you know, the formula, uh, the diffraction formula, you would find that yes, uh, those two things are absolutely precisely in agreement. So people get confused, uh, people are uh, fighting over it and uh, Einstein just decides to say that, hey, it's kind of both. You can think of this as a principle of uh, complete, I'm spelling this right, uh, which is to say that these two viewpoints that we're taking, particles and waves, are just viewpoints are looking at the same exact thing and thus uh, you know the modern version of quantum mechanics this is the core idea of quantum mechanics quantization and this duality idea was born and uh, from there on there were more and more revolutions uh, you know Bohr came up with this model of the atom that was hideously difficult and had we had to go through so many corrections and uh, and then more more ideas with respect to the same hydrogen atom which we discussed earlier such as the uh, hyperfine splitting and the hyperfine structure of it and uh, so on uh, but today we're not going to do that we're instead going to focus on the postulates uh, and the mathematics behind that for now and then we'll discuss a bit about spin and entanglement so that's the plan for today and we'll also review a bit of what's going on in the field i uh, will stop for a moment here if there are any questions Okay, all right. Uh, if there's questions, you can put it up on uh, the neighboring channel. I'll have a look and respond as soon as. But let's get started with the math. Um, and this is a physicist's uh, retelling of math. So uh, I should say by beware, but I will try to be as precise as I can. Uh, and if you guys find any errors, please do spot them out immediately. Um, so to start off with, we're going to define uh, something that's called a vector space, uh, and a vector space is simply a set at the end of the day, and uh, we define it over. I've I've called it here the complex plane C, uh, but uh, 
you know, this this could be anything. It could be even the real plane. Uh, but generally, it's called a field. You define a vector space over a field. We're not going to discuss what this is mathematically because it's a little bit more complicated. Maybe in you know after the the entire session, I can explain to you an idea of what this is because you know you need to understand a little bit of group theory for this first place. But anyways, uh, it's defined over a field uh, where you know these u's and v's are elements of this vector space set, and these alphas and uh, Betas are elements of the field or the, this complex plane. They are complex numbers. Um, I know that uh, many of us are kind of accustomed to the viewpoint that vectors are arrows, but uh, there's a more mathematically coherent structure, and I want to unbox the structure and unbox uh, some more things that are more interesting in this. So if you and we are uh, two vectors, you know, this addition operation, it's commutative. u plus v is equal to v plus u. And it's also associative, wherein u plus v, the whole plus w, you can sort of swap this around. And there's always an additive inverse, sorry, additive identity first, which is to say there's always a zero vector, there's always a null vector, which is to say that if you add the null vector with any vector, you just get the vector back again. Um, and there's an added, there's always an additive inverse in a set. Uh, that is, if I add it, there's always a negative. Uh, so, you know, you know, if you're visually, you can just think of this as, oh, if there's a vector v, then there's got to be another vector minus v that uh, that uh, they are both collinear. And if I add them both, I will just end up with a null vector. Okay. Uh, so, uh, multiplicative and distributive properties these pertain to the uh, to the complex uh, this field here, this complex plane. So if I have, uh, there's a multiplicative identity, which is to say there's an element there that if I multiply or if I, this is called the scalar product. So if I do the scalar product of that uh, number with uh, any vector, then it will be the same vector again. And this, I can do this distribution thing. And uh, there's the additive identity, which is identities, I should say, which is, uh, this is more distributive properties yet again. Um, uh, wait a second, mm, okay, yeah, uh, so these are the axioms, um, and uh, there's this, if you satisfy all of this, it's called a vector space, it's not just arrows, it's not just uh, things that, that you can visualize, but you have a coherent mathematical structure like this, it follows all these rules, then if, you, if it obeys all these rules, then yes, voila, you have a vector space. So you don't need to remember all of this, but just know that vectors aren't just arrows, but they are objects that follow these rules. That's the key point, and we will keep coming back to these rules. So you don't need to remember them, uh, more or less, but you can always get refer to them, get back to them, okay? Um, and for every vector space, there's this guy called a dual vector space, which is usually denoted by the star. And uh, the elements of a vector uh, dual space are denoted by this kind of uh, uh, thing. This is called a bra, by the way. Uh, oops. And this is called a ket. Uh, this is Dirac's idea. This wasn't uh, something a mathematician came up with, rather, but this is more of Dirac's idea of neatly representing things. But what is a bra? Is it a, the bra basically takes a vector and spits out a real number. And this isn't supposed to be here. Uh, but, um, <laughs> uh, but essentially it just spits out a real number. That's all it does. And uh, you, you can think of a, of a bra as a function that takes in a vector v and spits out a scalar alpha. Okay, so that's how you should think of as a bra, uh, 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 think of a bra as. And uh, of, uh, uh, usually a bra acting on a ket is given by this uh, guy here and I will expand more about this in the next slide but usually just just think of this as just um, oops. think of this as just this happening you're just sandwiching these guys and you're getting a real number out um, again the the cool thing is since you have every vector space as a corresponding dual space every vector or every element of a vector space has a corresponding dual to it um, and you can go to this dual by means of a function called a metric. And if this rings any bells, um, you might have seen x mu's in special relativity 
and how do you go from x mu to x mu all you have to do here is if I mul and let me just rename the indices a bit all you have to do is you have to multiply this by some g mu and this g mu is basically a matrix or a transformation that lowers this index and uh, this is something that we might have seen in special relativity and this lowering and raising might seem a little odd but right now we can sort of cast it in the language that we know these are vectors and my metric is taking a vector to its dual that's it that's all that's happening here nothing more nothing less okay i have given two fancy words symmetric bilinear let me break that down so when i say symmetric this g mu nu can be visualized sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a, the metric is actually a little more broader than this it's not just something that maps this to this but the metric in another perspective can be seen as taking two vectors and finding out the length okay so this is a perspective of looking at the metric and I will re-emphasize this in the next slide as well but when I say it's symmetric I basically mean g view v, v u vector is just the same as g u vector v vector or to cast it in the language of uh, special relativity g mu nu is just the same as g nu nu you know swapping the indices makes no change that's what symmetricity is uh, bilinear basically means it's linear in one argument in, in the sense i can do g of v vector comma some alpha times u vector and this is just the same as g of alpha times v vector I do, i'm not going to prove this uh, but uh, you can take it to be given. Whoops. Yeah. So this is essentially what it is. There's nothing more to it. Um, that is to say, if I scale one argument, that is equal to scaling the entire function. If you, it's, it, I can't take this as something that scales both of them. It's if it's linear here. When I say linear, I mean I can scale uh, these vectors up. And it will be something like alpha u plus alpha v, you know. Uh, so it's linear in one argument. And I can again add some vector here, some w here, and it will be linear in just this one argument. It's not linear in both of these arguments simultaneously. So that's what I meant by these words here, really fancy words. But they just mean something, simple ideas. And often in mathematics, which is why I think people shouldn't fear mathematics, it people are trying to categorize things, people are trying to compress things and beautifully organize them. So whenever you see some jargon that's being thrown around, it's usually trying to explain something in a more neater fashion. So you, I'm using this symmetric placeholder instead of writing out this entire line of mathematical reasoning. Uh, so yeah, that's what it means. Um, any questions so far? Guys. Uh, guys, can you hear me? Yes, uh, we can. Hear. So, any questions so far? Mm -hmm. What do you say? Okay, if there are no questions, I will then proceed to define the inner product. Uh, the inner product is just a bra acting on a cat. That's it. The bra is just doing the job. It's just the generalization of the dot product. And when I say dot product, a dot product is just a vector dot b vector, uh, which is often defined as uh, follows. Um, there is a cos theta, if I'm not wrong, which where theta is the angle between these two vectors. But it, uh, we're not really talking about arrows anymore, if you've noticed. And uh, you know, uh, here we're just trying to now talk more generally. So uh, 
it's a more gener general idea. So the idea right now is that a bra acts on the ket. That's it. So the bra is a function that takes a ket and gives me a real number and that's what it's doing and it has a certain set of properties uh, which uh, this sign should be the other way around apologies uh, so v and w when you swap the arguments you need to complex conjugate them um, this might seem odd but this conjugate only arises because uh, we are defining it our uh, vector space on top of uh, the complex number field C, but if you define it over R, you don't need this requirement, but in our case, yes, it holds. Uh, positive semi-definiteness is a very verbose term for saying uh, the inner product of the same vector and the, the, the vector and its own dual is always larger than zero. Uh, oh, whoops. Uh, it's, it's, it, if and only if V is not zero. Okay, so if it's not zero, then it's definitely a larger than zero. But if it is zero, uh, it's definitely larger than zero, not even larger than or equal to. But if it is zero, then if it's the null vector, then it's definitely going to be the inner product is definitely zero. And uh, this is how we sort of will define norm or the length of a vector, generically speaking as well. So just to give you a preview, the length of a vector v uh, in uh, a vector space or the vector space that we care about uh, is given as follows. So the norm of V, which is definite, is usually denoted by two lines in V. You take the inner product of with itself and you take the square root, you get this because, uh, uh, I mean, just think about it for a second. So if you have its corresponding dual, whoops, one second. Yeah, the corresponding dual is a, the way it works is it's, it's based on uh, this metric here. And I told you that the metric can be sort of thought of as the function that, oh, you take these two vectors, you shove it into the metric, you get the length. And right now that's kind of what we're doing because I can um, break this down in, in terms of, in, ter in special relativity terms, which are usually not done, but uh, just to give you guys an analogy of it, this is usually x mu, x mu is what we're talking about, uh, but obviously we can uh, rewrite uh, this uh, to be x, uh, oops, x mu nu, x mu, and uh, it's the metric doing its job again. Uh, and uh, linearity also is a case, uh, so it's linear in one argument, so if I have the the argument for vectors here, the the w, the the the, the gets are allowed to be linear, but the bras aren't. So uh, once again, there's a mistake here. Oh, this is this is a this is supposed to be a bra as well. This is a bra, and this is a bra as well. Um. um so yeah. This is how we're defining inner product. Um, and I've been talking about linearity so far, but I haven't told you what, oops, mistake again, uh, but I haven't told you what linear maps are. Uh, but simply put a linear map, you know, you can add inputs and the, the output would just be the sum of each input applied to the map separately. And I can scale the input and it would just be scaling just the argument uh, times the scalar itself. So this is what linear linearity is, and I think I'm kind of, whoopsies, I've missed out some things. <laughs> um, sorry guys, this was rather a very rushed one from the exams. Uh, next time we'll do better, but essentially, this place, uh, I missed out some content. Uh, but before we even go there, uh, Yes, let me talk about the Cartesian product. So, uh, if I have a set A, if I have a set B, uh, uh, set A has elements, uh, you know, elements AI, this has elements BI, uh, and if I take a product of these sets, or what's called a Cartesian product, I just want to find out the ordered pairs, which is to say all of the arbitrary 
AIs and BIs, the, all of the different ways in which they can be arranged. That's what I'm uh, looking for and that's what I call uh, the Cartesian product of these two uh, things. One second, let me just get some water. So the direct sum is um, is an idea with respect to vector spaces. Uh, so I should talk a little bit about something called a subspace. Uh, so a subspace is essentially a subset of a vector space, a subset which is to say a smaller set uh, from the larger set of same elements, uh, vector space. And uh, this, when this uh, subset is a proper subset, uh, well, this proper subset is also proper as in not just the identity, but it also has some other elements, some other arbitrary elements. And when this proper subset is also following the same axioms of a vector space, which is all these guys, then you call it a subspace. Then it's a subspace, or it's called a subvector space or subspace. So if I were to uh, define uh, subspaces u uh, one comma u two uh, that are in some larger vector space v. This is my awkward v. Uh, some large vector space v. Uh, we can then be decomposed in this form. And uh, there's just two conditions for this that uh, V can be expressed in this form if and only if uh, that this subspace and this subspace are completely contain elements that are that don't cross over each other which is to say they're if you draw a Venn diagram and there's no intersecting elements and uh, you know the only way to write zero here the only way to write identity here uh, is by taking all of these elements to be zero. So if I I can I can expand this as some element u y from here, some element u j from here, arbitrarily being added to form an element that exists here. You know uh, this is the set. Things can only be taken to be zero if uh, both of these things are zero. Okay. Uh, so th that's kind of a weird thing, which sort of means. Uh, it sort of breaks what I said before, if you list carefully, which is that that basically means this set must have zero, this set must have zero as well. Uh, well, apart from zero, I think uh, that applies, that holds, but I'm not very sure. Uh, but this is just a, an interesting idea, and uh, this is the condition that uh, a direct sum must hold. So a direct sum is given by this symbol. And uh, I hope I've, this this is not like a marathon like activity for you guys, <laughs> uh, but we are walking through some speed maths. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna define for you what is called a tensor product, but I'm only gonna define a tensor product uh, in the sense of a tensor product between uh, two vector spaces. Uh, V's and W's. So if I have an element V from here and if I have an element W from whoops, <laughs> from from here, uh, that is to say these are vectors, these are elements of a vector space. What is their tensor product? Uh, I am only restricting tensor product to this sense but tensor product can be uh, let me define it broadly first. That it can be used to construct tensors. This is a large word to throw around, which I'll define in a moment. Out of uh, you know vectors and duals. What the hell? does this mean? 
Okay, a lot of unpacking to be done here. Um, so if I have, so what is a tensor first of all? Um, let me quickly define a tensor. A tensor is a multi-linear map from uh, P, which is a quantity P vectors and Q duals to R. What the hell does this mean? Well, it's pretty simple actually. So if I have a tensor, usually it's defined as tensor P and Q. So P is the number of vectors it's eating, Q is the number of duals it's eating. So what it does is it takes all of these, it takes let's say let's have a uh, one one tensor so it has one vector one covector uh, and it spits out a real number that's it that's all that a tensor does so it takes p uh, and a good example of this kind of a tensor a one one tensor is your bloody metric tensor because a metric even though it's defined in this fashion for you know for physics sake truly 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 it takes one vector, one covector, or one uh, dual, and spits out a real number. So vectors, uh, I mean, so tensors are generalizations of this idea. Tensors take p number of vectors and q number of uh, duals, and spit out a real number. That's it. That's all that a tensor will do for you. And I use the word multilinear. Uh, so if you guys remember the idea bilinear. Uh, the idea bilinear was that it is linear in the second argument or it's linear in the first argument. It's never linear in both of the arguments. Uh, and multilinear is a generalization of this idea that it's always linear. This map is always this map R is always linear in one argument. Okay, so that's what a multi, even though it has multiple arguments, it's only linear in one of them. So that's what a tensor is. Uh, that's what. Uh, um, so yeah, <laughs> that's all it is. Um, so, anyways, um, let's see. So tensor products basically combine vectors and duals to form tensors. That's all that they do. So. Um, now I'm going to define for you the tensor product. Uh, so a tensor product of two vectors, because that's what Mukund will be concerned with, that's what we are concerned with for now, at least. Uh, maybe we can discuss uh, the, the further generalizations later on when we're thinking uh, you know, in, in more general settings other than just quantum mechanics. Um, okay. So what a tensor product does is when I take the tensor product of some vector space V and some vector space W, all I'm doing is uh, that I am going to create a set of bilinear functions or I'm going to set, I'm going to create a set of duals that have two arguments instead and all all this new tensor that was created uh, out of this idea is so basically this produces uh, this set this produces this the set and what the set does is it takes a vector h and a vector g from ve a vector space v and from the vector space uh, from the cartesian product of the vector space v and w which is to say if my v had elements h and my w had elements g now the cartesian product must always talk about this ordered pair h comma g ordered pair as in h comma g is not the same as g comma h that's all okay so that's all it is so this ordered pair now this uh, tensor acts on this ordered pair and takes this ordered pair to the real number Okay, so that's all this tensor product between two vector spaces is going to do for us. It takes uh, an ordered pair 
from the vector space and it sends it uh, to the real number uh, uh, line and in fact it's this tensor product creates the set of creates a set uh, of uh, all uh, you know uh, elements uh, uh, whose elements are basically the Cartesian product of the duals of the corresponding vector space. So it's a rather general abstract idea, but I think it's very neat when it's defined in such a fashion. Uh, but of course, you can have tensor products between duals, and you can have tensor product uh, uh, duals and duals, and tensor products between duals and vectors. But that's a different uh, conversation. I'm going to restrict myself to this. And with this, uh, I will then, I can finally then define <laughs> what a Hilbert space is, <laughs> followed by uh, the postulates. Uh, but I think we've done some heavy, heavy math right now. Uh, so I'll pause for questions. Please uh, shoot away. Uh, what's, uh, what's been confusing or what's been ill-defined in yours according to you right now? Guys, questions? Okay, I will move now. So, um, now that we understand all of these ideas, I'm going to finally explain to you what a Hilbert space is. And Hilbert space is very important in quantum mechanics because our state vectors live there. And we'll discuss that in a moment. But uh, without that, uh, in our head, Hilbert spaces are essentially what are called inner product. Whoops. Slash normed, or sometimes it's called normed. So it's an inner product vector space or a normed vector space. And a normed vector space basically is a vector space along with a way to define lengths between its elements. Okay, that's all it is. And the norm, as I stated before, in our case, is defined as the square root of the action of the dual on the on the on its corresponding vector. Okay, and uh, another second condition that we are not centrally concerned about right now, but I think it's still worth stating since we're talking about uh, how we axiomatically define it, is that it's complete. And when I say complete, it means Cauchy sequences converge. Lot of lot of words, lot of words uh, thrown around. So, what is a Cauchy sequence? Um, recursively speaking, a Cauchy sequence is a sequence uh, that if you take two arbitrary sequences, two arbitrary Cauchy sequences, uh, two, uh, sorry, two two sections of an arbitrary sequence, a n and a m, and if you calculate the norm of them, the norm is zero, is what a Cauchy sequence is. But that makes absolutely no sense or in at least in the context in which we are speaking about. So I'll give you a more physics-esque example of, of what a Cauchy sequence might seem like. Uh, so uh, a Cauchy sequence essentially is a sequence whose terms uh, become smaller uh, as the order becomes higher. So this is to say that if you take your damped oscillator for example, this is kind of the waveform that you will encounter. And if you were to take sections of this and present it as a sequence with respect to time uh, by taking time slices of it. Um, so you can notice uh, that uh, uh, that the, 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 the terms become smaller and smaller and thus when you take a summation of them to infinity they must sort of converge even though I can't exactly prove it to you logically or heuristically, I hope that makes sense to you. Uh, so that's what a Cauchy sequence is and our idea is that all these Cauchy sequences must converge in our uh, Hilbert space. So that's the crux. But 
the po first point is arguably more important for our discussions. So our Hilbert space has a norm that is defined in such a fashion. It's a vector space that has a particular norm defined in this fashion. And with that, the mathematical uh, wrangling that, I, that we had to go through right now is kind of over uh, because we, although it's over, we will be needing them to define the postulates. So I'll take a short break here. So any questions right now? Uh, questions, guys? Vijay, Eric, Mukund, Roshan, you guys? No, none from me. Okay. Oh, cool. So now I think then we can actually rigorously state the, the four postulates of quantum mechanics. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to state the postulates, I'm going to state two corollaries, and I'm going to stop there. Uh, we did have a plan to do two time models. Maybe we will discuss time models on Tuesday or Wednesday uh, when Rishi's around. Uh, Rishi's uh, taking a break at this point. So uh, he will be doing the time models. Uh, but for now, we will discuss postulates and discuss entanglement, uh, followed by some review of contemporary uh, literature of uh, quantum foundations. So the first postulate is that there is this object called a state vector, a, which is an element of a Hilbert space. And all the information about the system is contained in the state vector. And all the information you want can be extracted from the state vector in a particular fashion. So the state vector is our go-to all. Uh, it has everything you need to know about the system. And uh, in some cases, the position basis representation is preferred. So the position basis representation is uh, of the state vector is this basically just the wave function. And uh, you project it along the uh, of along the basis vectors of the position basis, you obtain the wave function. Okay, so whenever I say wave function, that means the basis vectors are, in our sense, we use were used sort of just. Uh, I think I missed this earlier, which is we're sort of used to thinking of, uh, you know, our i hats, j hats, and k hats as basis vectors in, in our Cartesian space. Uh, but basis vectors can be some sometimes more general uh, because these i's and j's and k's in, written in Dirac fashion, what they do is you can arbitrarily create combinations uh, of these three uh, vectors and you can basically cover up or basically create any other element of the vector space just by scaling and adding these three bases uh, and uh, this is to say that they span this case they span the entire space and so they're called bases and uh, for our convention sake we assume that they are orthonormal. That is, if I have two basis vectors, i and j, and if I take the inner product between i and j, uh, it will only be, it, so if it's, if both these vectors are i's, then this is one, this is the Kronecker delta, one if, I equal to j, 0 if uh, uh, i is not equal to j. So if they're not, then the dot product will be 0 and they're just called orthonormal. To break this word apart, orthogonal, which is to say their inner products are 0, i, j, 0, even i is not equal to j, and normal. That is to say, I if I take the inner product of of these two vectors, it will just be one. It's normalized. It's length. Uh, uh, the square root of the inner product, that is to say, is one. It's the normalization convention. Uh, but these are conventions. This is a convention uh, for us uh, to have them orthonormalized. You needn't have them orthonormalized. Uh, some cases they are by nature orthonormalized. Uh, 
but a uh, few cases you may not have these orthonormalized vectors. So you have to do something called Gram-Schmidt procedure, which is a procedure to construct orthonormal. Uh, I'm just not going to spell Schmidt because I have no idea how it's spelled. But uh, <laughs> it's essentially a procedure. It's an algorithm to construct orthonormal basis out of uh, you know just arbitrary basis vectors. Um, so this connects very uh, deeply with the second postulate, which I'll talk about in a moment. But even before that, the wave function has to satisfy a few more uh, things. Uh, these are called admissibility conditions, uh, and these are more. Uh, these are, in a sense, these are uh, corollaries, uh, so that uh, this principle is uh, not in contrast with the ones that follow it. Okay. And we will come back to it once we discuss all the, uh, the postulates to get a better idea. But essentially, right now, you should know that this is more of a convention. It's more comfortable to work with an orthonormal set. But later on, we will see that normalization is very, very important because we want all the probabilities to sum to 1. And we will see why in a moment. Uh, but uh, this should be fairly obvious as well because if it does not satisfy the boundary conditions of the system it represents, then it isn't faithfully representing the system itself. It's not physically realized. So it doesn't make sense, thus we don't care about it. Uh, the idea that it should be continuous, smooth, quadratically integrable are kind of arbitrary in our head right now, but it will make sense. We will come back to it once we discover the fourth postulate. Now, the second postulate has something to do with things that are called observables. These observables are basically these linear maps. Now, in quantum mechanics, uh, oftentimes there's a process that's often discussed that's called quantization. First quantization, second quantization, and so on. Quantization is essentially promoting your variables to operators. So if you want to extract, let's say, information about momentum from a particular state vector, you act on the state vector with the corresponding momentum operator and then you get information about it. So first thing you should know is that these operators are self-adjoint or Hermitian, which is to say they are equal to their own adjoints. And the adjoint operator uh, or the adjoint dagger that's given here basically means conjugation, complex conjugation and transpose. And the, and by the way, this, this is more of a mathematical uh, necessity that we are uh, doing uh, for just so that we satisfy the corollaries. I'll explain why in a moment. But um, essentially, this is more mathematical than physical, and you can see why uh, without me even telling you. Why. So these days, uh, a more modern version has emerged, which I will link to. That's called PT symmetric. Uh, and, uh, you know, the operators no longer need to be Hermitians. They just need to be symmetric to parity changes uh, in the momentum and uh, time uh, arguments, which is to say, if I, the parity symmetry basically means P going to minus P and T going to minus T. It just needs to be the same under these transformations. So this is a PT symmetric theory of quantum mechanics and it has some interesting things to say about nature and the, uh, and it's quite different from the one that we're discussing right now, but it's it still captures the same essential results is what I'm trying to tell you. And maybe later on we will discuss about PT symmetric theories. Now, I talked about extracting information. What do I mean by that? So if I act on a particular state vector with, by an observable, uh, the only physically observable values that I get are the eigenvalues of the state vector. So this is called an eigenvalue equation. And this basically means that when I apply this operator on the state vector, nothing happens to the state vector other than the fact that it's scaled. It's scaled by a factor of lambda. Okay, so this factor of lambda is called the eigenvalue, 
and this psi, this psi that can go over a particular range is called a uh, it's called an eigenvector or it's called an eigenstate uh, alternatively they just mean the same thing because ultimately it's the state vector and uh, when you say eigenvector eigenstate they mean the same idea so don't be confused when people interchange those words they mean the exact same thing so it's only these lambdas that are observable so when I extract information, this is what I will be able to observe. And a few, and an interest more satisfying uh, fact because of, uh, of this, because centrally, these two correlates centrally because of the hermicity, and we want them to be Hermitian because of these two. Uh, it's rather tautological, but it helps in a sense, is that we want these lambdas to be real. Because we cannot observe to talk about observing complex numbers in the physical world is kind of nonsensical uh, you know but there's even work saying that to observe real numbers is also nonsensical which i will discuss later on uh, but um, essentially you will only be a you know measuring real numbered values so that makes sense the eigenvalues must be real numbers and the eigenstates you know psi i and psi j like different eigenstates form an orthonormal basis state which is to say that they follow this relation which is if I take an eigenstate uh, psi i, and if I take an eigenstate psi j, and if I take the inner product of them, uh, the inner product should be given by uh, the chronic adult. Uh, so this is uh, uh, two corollaries that we get from this. Um, and uh, this should be postulate 3, apologies. Uh, but essentially, uh, state vector, when it comes to the state vector, uh, when it comes to the time evolution, let's say if I have a time evolution operator of a state vector, and if I apply it, what I get is rather interesting because what I, I can decompose this as is I can decompose this as some u vector, u hat acting on uh, psi zero, which is to say that this is something that's called a stationary state. It's called stationary uh, because it's uh, uh, time independent uh, in a sense. When I say time independent, I do not mean to say that its components are time independent, but its probability density, which I'll define in a moment, is time independent. But this will all play into one another. And this U given here, this time evolution operator is what we will call be unitary um, and this unitarity basically means I can uh, multiply this by its own its own adjoint and I will end up with an identity element or identity matrix so that's what unitarity is essentially okay um, and time evolution can take different pictures uh, the first picture is the Schrodinger picture where the state vectors evolve with respect to time but the operators don't. The operators are time independent. Uh, and whereas the opposite of that is the Heisenberg picture where the operators evolve. Operators evolve. Uh, but the state vectors do not evolve. Okay? So, uh, this is, and they are both governed by different dynamical equations. And uh, just to point this out, this is what's called a commutator, O hat, H hat basically means O hat H hat minus H hat O hat um, and this H hat is an important guy because uh, quantum this is a quantum mechanical Hamiltonian which is to say it uh, basically represents uh, in a loose sense it's basically just the uh, energy uh, if it's time in the time independent case uh, or here it's simply just T plus V generically speaking, whereas it's just the kinetic energy plus the potential energy of the entire system. Uh, right. Uh, so, yes, so the, this is how the equations work. And the reason these equations are both absolutely equivalent uh, uh, is given by something that's called the Stone von Neumann theorem. Uh, we wouldn't need to discuss that, but I can naively tell you why they're the same thing. Here's the idea. So, uh, later on, uh, when we're talking about measurement, 
what we realize is that uh, measurement is dif it's, it's it's not unitary it's not deterministic whereas this evolution is deterministic we can go forwards and backwards in time there's no problem with uh, these laws here but here what happens is once you make a measurement which is to say once your apparatus in Bohr's language once an apparatus interacts with a quantum mechanical system then what happens is something called state forwardment or state transformation where your state vector becomes your eigenstate okay and the pro and this is stochastic this is probabilistic this is not predictable this is where the unpredictable element of quantum mechanics comes in and it's given by something called bonds rule where the uh, probability of observing a given eigenstate is given by its inner product with the state vector it's projection the projection of the state vector along that uh, eigen uh, state or in this case it's called an eigen basis because as I said earlier you can construct a orthonormal basis out of the eigen states. So essentially uh, when we're doing this it's often times when I'm considering an operator row often times it's better to talk about the average value of O rather than a specific eigenstate because it's probabilistic so we'd rather talk about averages or meshes of central tendency rather than that so the uh, you know the average value of this is uh, simply just uh, the sum over all elements uh, where it's this given eigenvalue o times the probability of this eigenvalue o okay that's all it is or in Dirac's language uh, what happens is you want to calc when you're trying to do this you basically end up with this guy so now how does this relate to postulate 3 is that it does not matter if one of these ideas change if one of these is time independent and the others is not it doesn't matter which one is which because at the end of the day you sandwich this you end up with a singular real number and that is what is realized and that is why they are equivalent and uh, in some senses changing transforming the state vector is called an active transformation whereas transforming the uh, your observables is called a passive transformation here what we see is that active and passive transformations mean the same thing okay so that is what is given to us here so this is more of an active transformation perspective this is a passive transformation perspective so for example an active transformation uh, basically uh, means if I'm measuring the length of a, of, a, of a rod, that means I'm actively changing the length of the rod. Whereas if I'm uh, a passive transformation in the same case would be uh, trying to measure the length of the rod, but changing the length of my measuring stick. Okay? That's, that's all uh, that's being said here. So active transformations basically mean we're actively changing the object in question. Passive transformations relate to coordinate transformations or the way we're, we're sort of viewing the system and uh, here both of these things are the same thing uh, because we're only going to be talking about average values uh, or sometimes these are called expectation um, values so uh, these two evolutions are the same thing and now that we've discussed postulate 4 let me take you back to the admissibility conditions we say quadratically integrable because uh, the idea is that, uh, as we saw in Bond's rule, the inner product must be real valued and it must be single real valued. So, uh, in to speak it uh, to speak of it in terms of wave functions, you essentially have this relationship popping out uh, due to the conservation of probability, and we'll see a more stronger case of this uh, as well soon. Uh, so that's what this is. The single equation encapsulates all of these three, and uh, that's pretty much it. This is all uh, a corollary of uh, Bond's rule uh, playing into uh, your uh, state vector postulate. Uh, so before I talk about, uh, uh, you know, this is a summary of postulates. So let me just uh, walk you through it. So we're talking about quantum mechanics. Oops. You have the state vector, the state vector exists and all the information about the system is contained in the state vector 
and extract information about a particular observable, you act on it with an operator and the operators are uh, Hermitian, which is to say uh, it's self-adjoint and the most independent operator is actually x and b and any other observable can be constructed out of uh, as a function of x and b operators and uh, they have something called an eigenvalue equation as we discussed earlier and the eigenvalues are real and the eigenfunctions form an orthonormal basis and the other two are uh, to say that these the, the time evolution there are two different pictures one where the state vector evolves, one where the operator evolves and uh, they both have different uh, equations of evolution uh, but they be, both mean the same thing because of the linkage between ex because we're only going to be talking about expectation values rather than uh, something else and uh, the probability can be calculated as follows from Bond's rule and it's basically the absolute square of, of a wave function or it can sometimes be written as uh, yeah. and this process is completely random in the sense that you, you can tell that there's a higher chance of this eigenstate being observed or this eigenvalue being observed but you cannot say with certainty uh, that this is what you will get so that is why we prefer uh, to talk about uh, uh, expectation values rather than uh, things like this. So I will pause here since we've just done some heavy lifting before I go for uh, our uh, corollaries which is the continuity equation uh, and the uncertainty relation which I'll briefly describe and then hand it over to Mukut. So questions right now? Uh, any questions guys? Questions? Okay. No, I carry on. One second, let me just uh, fix some water. Yeah. All right. Um. So the continuity equation is just a stronger form of probability conservation. And the uncertainty relation uh, is basically telling us there's no free lunch in the quantum realm. And let me expand about those statements briefly. So, um, this is basically the commutator and there's an expectation value of the commutator and there's an absolute sign. That's why it, it's a bit awkward and the first time I saw it I was like, wait, what is this? But there's a commutator and you're trying to find the expectation value of the commutator and you're finding the absolute value of the com of this because you don't want a negative number. That's why you have this absolute sign uh, here. <clears throat> and you have these deltas that are weird. Uh, so what are uh, the deltas? Uh, what do they mean? Uh, so essentially we talked about uh, expectation values. So expectation value of A is just, you know, sun, this beautiful sandwich um, and you can also define expectation values of a squared and so on you know that would just be a squared operator where a squared basically means uh, a operator times a operator right now here's the thing this this delta uh, in this case basically uh, is referring to something called standard deviation. Uh, so the standard deviation of an operator A is given by the equation expectation value of oops, A squared minus the expectation value of A the whole square. Now you might think this is bizarre, but uh, what the standard deviation is essentially quantifying for me is how much is my how much of my observed values the, ob the different observed values that I get deviate from the mean, and by how much and what is the average of this deviation? That's what the uh, standard deviation is quantifying for me. 
okay so what are we trying to say when we say that standard deviation of a times b is larger than this number uh, i think it's better expressed when we're talking about position and momentum in the case of this here and this is the heisenberg uncertainty relation between the position and momentum and what this is telling us is that this product is when it's not zero what it basically means is i cannot to a hundred percent measure uh, these two things completely if i want to measure x precisely all of the uncertainty will flow into p and this is not systemic you know measurement apparatus based on certainty no 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 this is a limit that nature is setting on me uh, that i cannot make an observation of this particular type beyond this particular uh, amount and this uncertainty much akin to the uh, this stochasticity that we saw in the measurement process is inherent um, uh, to quantum mechanics okay so yeah so this this is just inbuilt into quantum mechanics there's a uh, you know the, the, so so what happens in a more abstract sense is that if if this is non zero that basically means uh, you know th this you cannot get both of these uh, you cannot measure both of these simultaneously and uh, the example here is that uh, you know the commutator of uh, x hat and p hat sometimes called the canonical commutation relation is given by i h bar or to be more abstract uh, in three dimensions uh, or, or in two dimensions it's given by x hat i j where if it's the same uh, x you know it's the momentum and position operator along the same uh, dimension yeah uh, so you can just sort of sub this in for this commutator and see that you'll get i h bar and this i n i cancel and you just get a h bar by 2 and you end up with this guy but uh, if that is to say th these are sometimes called non uh, you know compatible observables uh, that is to say you cannot get both of them uh, com you cannot completely gain information about both of them simultaneously uh, so if they don't commute you don't get both of them for free uh, that's it uh, so that's the idea behind the uncertainty relation um, and if you have more questions about it, we'll discuss it in the very end. I do not want to take away Bogle's time. And I'll quickly go through what's called the continuity relation. And uh, the continuity equation is, is just the quantum mechanical version of the usual set of continuity equations that pop up in, uh, you know, in electrodynamics or in uh, your fluid dynamics and so on. But um, here, your rho is just your probability density psi psi bar uh, and uh, your j is rather a very complicated uh, your j is this h bar by 2 m i um, I think it's psi bar times nabla psi minus nabla psi bar times psi so um but all this is telling me is just um, uh, two things it's telling me exactly th actually three things and you don't even need to understand the equations completely to get the consequence but the consequence is as follows the probability density rho evolves deterministically and sometimes this can also be interpreted as the quantum mechanical analog of Liouville's equation which we discussed earlier so it evolves deterministically like a fluid and the fluid dynamic analogy is pretty strong here given that it's equivalent to the divergence of a particular uh, 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 you know idea as well uh, and this deterministic evolution uh, also means that if let's say i have a normalization uh, that is done uh, earlier on uh, when i'm considering my system you know, this normalization is uh, done once uh, and if, but if I take now if I take the time derivative of this it would definitely be zero 
that is to say my nor my probability density evolves deterministically and once it's normalized it doesn't need to be renormalized later on that is provided there's no annihilation and uh, you know formation of particles creation and annihilation which is it's a good approximation for non relativistic quantum mechanics and uh, the second one is that all probabilities are the one so this is uh, these are our take takeaways and i will summarize before i leave things out book so what we've seen is that nature uh, the energy is quantized in the, at quantum mechanical scales and there, there are two different pictures there are two different viewpoints of doing the same thing so it's a wave and a particle uh, so that's the wave particle duality and we saw the heavy arena of math which we used to define quantum mechanics axiomatically um, and this uh, axiomatic approach then showed us inherent limitations uh, so there was a so stochasticity in the measurement process it was just being random um, and there was there's the uncertainty relation right now that is another limit as well but that being said our probabilities are conserved uh, normalization goes across time uh, and so on and uh, another important takeaway is our variables are promoted to uh, operators and the operators follow these rules uh, so yeah i will i would stop here uh, it's been a rather marathon run so questions are welcome before i switch out to book any questions guys Okay, Mukul. Or else, better yeah. like we'll keep all the questions at the to end. To the end, yes, that's better actually. Uh, Mukul, in that case, you can take over. Okay, so welcome again, all. <laughs> so I think I probably you know give a one minute grab, like want to grab some water to drink. You can. <clears throat> so mostly, what I'll be uh, covering in this part and my part is. A uh, one half that is spin. That is basically what uh, if I mean considering the, uh, our group. So we learned it in our uh, quantum mechanics course in the undergrad third year. So I'll be covering uh, mostly about what we've learned and a little about what is the problem with spin. So the, and then I'll be moving over the entanglement, uh, you know, concept. So that thing is actually pretty. You know, new or for some, uh, unless you guys are already acquainted with the concept. So we'll be moving into you know the more deep and technical details of what uh, quantum entanglement is and what is also again we're talking about the <coughs> some uh, like uh, uh, concept of QM and why uh, we are having trouble with QM as such in that particular area. So. Okay, I think I'll start since yeah, almost so. So, uh, spin. So basically, uh, we uh, we can say, you know, from a beginner's perspective, we can say that a you know a quantum mechanical particle also possesses angular momentum. But a quantum mechanical particle possesses, you know, two kinds of angular momentum. That is intrinsic as well as in uh, extrinsic angular momentum. So the extrinsic extrinsic angular momentum is what we observe when we you know try to uh, you know uh, you know uh, try to induce a magnetic field a uniform or non-uniform magnetic field in front of a quantum particle and we can try to you know, see the observation and try to understand the nature of the or you can calculate the angular momentum of a specific particle. So the intrinsic angular momentum is is the topic of our concern right now. So uh, first, okay, and so the spin is a property of a particle that is attributed to its intrinsic angular momentum. So a particle can uh, possess a spin pair. So a spin pair is nothing but you know spin is basically uh, in a in a, a extra uh, as Pauli explained it. It is a it is an other uh, degree of freedom given to a particle rather than its three dimensions of motion. So a spin uh, basically is uh, uh, there are two types of spin in a sp along a specific axis. So the spin along say uh, uh, y axis would uh, would be left uh, in and out, and along z axis would be up and down, and then along x axis would be right and left. 
So there are two pairs of spin along each axis. Uh, we can actually choose uh, any reference axis for our own and we can try to attribute these uh, pairs of spin as, as per our wish. So I have chosen the Z axis to be up and down, the X axis to be right and left, and the Y axis to be in and out uh, spin pairs. So next slide, Pugat. Yes, so uh, why, like how did we try to, you know, uh, come about the concept of spin? So first, uh, we, you know, we tried to uh, observe the atomic spectra to understand about the you know, nature of the specific particle or an atom. So uh, when we try to, uh, the emission, uh, actually the absorption and emission spectra is nothing but, so when we try to induce some sort of uh, energy source to uh, an atom, so uh, the electrons or the outermost electrons, they try to, uh, they, they tend to observe the energy, actually absorb the energy and then they get excited to a higher state. And then uh, they stay there for a certain amount of time and then they try, they come back or they fall back to their uh, original state. So uh, come back, uh, fall back to uh, another, uh, another orbit or another state. So due to this, uh, oscillation as well, or we can call it as a excitation and de-excitation process, the certain amount of energy is released. So we uh, calculate the, uh, you know, we observe the energy that is also being released by the atom and we try to make our uh, calculation and observation and we can understand the properties of that specific uh, atom as to how many valence electrons does it contain and uh, so on. So for, uh, in the early uh, quantum mechanics uh, as in like when we just started to explore the quantum world. So uh, the uh, <clears throat> atomic spectra is mostly based on the N, L and M quantum numbers. That is the N is the principal quantum number, L is the azimuthal quantum number and then M is the magnetic quantum number. So, uh, so in general transition is only allowed. So basically the eigenvalues or what we learn in our in our quantum mechanics course are basically the given set of values at which on, at only at which the electron can be present at the specific time. So only at a sp uh, only uh, ev each and every uh, orbit or you can say uh, an orbital or a state is uh, has some specified energy values and only if uh, if the energy value matches with the allowed energy values the electron can uh, be present at that specific point in the atom so uh, so the uh, transition uh, is only allowed if all three quantum numbers change in that process only if the uh, because the transition is what from a higher lower state to a higher state so that means all the three quantum numbers uh, of the specific uh, electron will be uh, will be you know will change uh, when it try it, when it undergoes the trans the transition. So this is because the transition will be able to cause the emission or absorption of the electromagnetic radiation only if it involves a change in the electromagnetic dipole of the atom. So since <clears throat> So this is the condition for the uh, for an electron to undergo transition. So uh, later on, we just, we know like from it is nothing but uh, you know the kind of splitting of the uh, splitting of uh, the fine splitting. The hyperfine splitting is exactly what it is. So hyperfine splitting in the uh, the <coughs> uh, what is it called the spectral graph that is being observed, atomic spectrum graph that is being observed from basically the Zeeman effect so uh, that is observed under high resolution uh, using high resolution uh, microscope the observing devices so we were able to see a sort of a split in the graph or uh, the uh, the uh, uh, emission spectrum that is being emitted from an atom so we uh, from Zeeman effect we know that the n l and m uh, quantum numbers were not sufficient for us to understand the exact state or the exact uh, property of the specific electron in the atom. So we needed a new uh, new uh, quantum number or a new, uh, what do you say, a new quantity that would allow us to uh, try to, you know, fit the uh, discrepancies in the observed and, our, uh, and the existing theory at that moment. So <clears throat> Uh, George uh, Uhlenbeck and Samuel G Samuel Gow, uh, they took on the uh, idea of poly. Actually, poly was kind of uh, not ready to accept the idea of electron 
processing a spin uh, in all, in, all, in order to only just explain why they were able to get the anomalies in the specific graph but later on when it was uh, you know theoretically also uh, was possible and was also experimentally proven later by stern uh, the stern gelag experiment uh, thing so Pauli was later ready to you know was able to accept the uh, concept of spin and he also proposed a new quantum degree of freedom so that is the spin <clears throat> so uh, the uh, new the uh, actually the discovery of spin actually goes to Samuel Gauss, uh, for discovering the concept of spin so next slide Pugar. so yeah so let's look at the experimental part of how spin was discovered and how we were experimentally able to justify the concept of spin. So Otto Stern and Walter Gerlach. So they took on this theoretical concept and obviously physics is nothing but showing experimental proof as to us, uh, for a theory to be, you know, uh, applicable in uh, various fields. So we need an experimental evidence that this certain uh, 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 new degree of freedom of spin exists in the in the electrons so <clears throat> they wanted to experimentally determine the spatial quantization of spin moment of the momentum of electron of atoms situated in the magnetic field so uh, it's kind of a fancier but they just wanted to see if the electron exhibited the co correct uh, the amount of theoretical predictions that are made that the electron should possess spin in this way in the spatial quantization of the spin of moment of the spin moment so that is the exact uh, idea that they had suggested so the original experiment uh, took the form of a collimated beam of silver atom so silver atom as we know it has the uh, 2p uh, sorry 4s1 i suppose uh, 4s1 electronic configuration so there is only one valence electron the uh, valence orbital so they wanted to because uh, they are tried with uh, first they tried with a 2p1 uh, elemental configuration type uh, with an element having 2p1 configuration so since p uh, for for the uh, p orbital the value of l is 1 so the values that the magnetic quantum number takes is minus one zero and one so they were experimentally able to also see different bands show for those three different uh, magnetic quantum numbers when they, it was exposed to a magnetic field so they wanted to see as to like how uh if only uh, if for like an s orbital for example so the s orbital has uh, quantum number L quantum number to be zero, so basically there should be no difference, right? When it is being when the electron is passing through the magnetic field, you just go and directly straight hit on the straightly uh, go and hit on the screen, and then it should show just the uh, just the indication that it has directly passed through without any uh, deviations as such. But that was not so. So they took in this case they took the uh, silver atoms and uh, they were heading in the y direction. Say for an example, so y direction. And then they, it was allowed to pass through non directed along the z uh, z direction. Next slide, please. Yeah. So this is the experimental setup. So I think I can can look off look on to this uh, diagram later and understand intrinsic details. So I'll go on with the theory since. So next slide, please. So the assuming the silver atoms possess non-zero magnetic moment, obviously because there is a single electron that is there in the valence shift, so it will have some amount of non-zero magnetic moment. So the magnetic field first will have two effects. First, uh, the magnetic field will exert a torque onto the magnetic dipole. So that is uh, given by the force, so, so R cross F, and then it will obviously uh, induce a certain torque onto the uh, magnetic dipole of the uh, Atom. So the magnetic moment vector will precess pre about the direction of magnetic. So precess is nothing but the you know the ability to undergo precession. Precession nothing but for the axis to be aligned along a specific direction, favor the motion of a specific object. So we can go look <laughs> later about the definition. So that is what I have understood from. So it will process along the direction of the magnetic field. So since it is allowed, it is the torque is being induced to the specific electron, it will go along the direction of the magnetic field. 
and then secondly uh, the non uniform uh, uniformity of the magnetic field means that the atom exp experiences a sideways force that's why like the precession is like almost tilting the axis of the of the uh, you know rotation due to the uh, induced torque so it will it will go it will have a certain tilt and it will go along the mid direction of the magnetic field so the force is given by minus d taking along the z direction z axis so the u uh, is given by minus mu dot b so if we make the substitution we get f z is equals to minus mu z into do b by do z so mu z is nothing but the magnetic moment that is mu uh, mu is represented by see along the z axis so mu z is nothing but plus or minus mu b so mu b here is nothing but the bohr magneton so it was a specific constant value that was <coughs> count uh, that was calculated by niels bohr so it had the formula of e h bar by 2 m m times m uh, two times me m is the mass of the electron so <coughs> so the uh, spin uh, so after they had uh, uh, after the experiment was conducted so the they found that uh, even though there was only like one electron that is being ejected from the s orbital for which l is equal to 0 so the m values should be zero as well right so instead of showing a single band uh, after it hit the the screen or the plate photographic plate so it showed uh, under uh, deep inspection it showed that uh, it it was observed that there were actually two separate bands that were there so if you would go to the previous slide but in the experimental diagram so yeah so you can see the <coughs> on the photographic plate it shows that two there are two specific uh, you know lines it's called as like some hyperfine splitting on under that so you were able they were able to see so it's a classical expectation was just the one line but then the experimental result was they got distinct lines so this uh, they were confused as to why this was uh, this happened and then they were able to attribute that yes the electron had to possess an intrins intrinsic spin so <clears throat> we can go to the next slide so this was also experimentally so uh, the uh, two uh, young phd's that had mentioned before, they had come up with an explanation that it had to be due to the intrinsic angular momentum or the spin of the electron so the spin of the electron doesn't depend on uh, you know any external agents or it doesn't depend on anything else it's just an inborn property that a electron ha needs to have in order to you know uh, you know sustain uh, in order to exist as an electron so like that every other quantum particle was also later found to be uh, you know to have possess the uh, extra degree of freedom that is called as spin so this was ex experimentally also so the spin along the x axis is equals to y in you know, sx sy energy was found to be plus or minus h bar by 2 so this is about the experimental deep and next let me go so yeah if i had to uh, represent the uh, spin along the each direction in a matrix form so this actually i didn't want to go too deep into the you know uh, this how the how this uh, spin matrices are being uh, you know calculated uh, this is some it's it has to do something with the lowering and raising operator so i guess sx would be s plus minus s minus so yeah you can go to that later on if you are interested so sx would be the h bar by 2 Uh, h bar by two times the matrix zero one one zero, s y would be h bar by two times zero minus one t minus i i and zero, and then s z would be h bar by two one zero zero minus one. So next slide. So s x. Uh, so based uh, the uh, we can see that s x is equals to h bar by two times some sigma x. So what is this sigma x? So basically. <coughs> so the sigma x sigma y and sigma z are basically called the pauli spin matrices or the spin vectors so uh, just uh, in order to represent uh, in terms of a more fundamental this is called as the spin uh, spin vector so since we'll be dealing with that more as we go on since it, that is more uh, essential than the spin x uh, the spin matrix itself so we calculated the pauli spin matrices as spin vectors so which is nothing but uh, 2 by h bar times the spin uh, spin matrix along the specific direction 
So we calculated uh, sigma x is equal to 0, 1, 1, sigma y to be 0 minus i, and then sigma c to be 1, 0, 0 minus 1. So then down below, we also have the commutation relation as to how these spin matrices or the spin vectors commute with each other. So, <clears throat> so commutation relation is, I think, commutation of sigma x and sigma y will give me 2 to i times that of sigma z. So again, sigma y and sigma z times that of sigma x. And then sigma z and sigma z, uh, commutation of sigma z and sigma x will be, give me 2 times that of sigma y. So this is about the spin, the concept of spin, and how we can, you know, calculate the all these spin matrix or the spin vectors from them. So this is of great use for us because <coughs> excuse, uh, this is also an essential uh, concept and essential detail we need that we need in order to understand the quantum mechanical system. So, and it has also proved to be one of the most fundamental aspects of a particle in the quantum. So next slide, Tua. So okay, so that is about spin. So do you guys have any doubts? Clarifications that has to be. Yeah, okay. So I will go on into the more interesting concept because it is new to quite some quite some people. So about entanglement. So we have all, might have conversations. We uh, tend to you know look up on the internet of the. Uh, new emerging field. We also come up, uh, you know, interesting topics. So one of the most interesting topics, quantum entanglement. So quantum entanglement is nothing but, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so okay. So under to understand this, I'll leave this. I'll not spoil you any more about this. I'll try to go from the basics and we'll try to slowly try to build the math as well as the concepts that is required to understand the uh, concept of quantum entanglement. So again, tensor product, I think Cougar had already explained this. I wasn't sure. So tensor product, again, the same definition, but I use in terms of uh, you know, uh, two vector spaces and uh, tensor product, A, A or tensor product, that is A, uh, how do I say, O, uh, A tensor pro A times vector space, A vector space, going a tensor product. So, uh, uh, will give me is a vector space. So basically a tensor product is two vector spaces that uh, you know gives uh, undergoing the tensor product will give me another vector space in which all the elements from the vector space A and B are mapped one to one with the elements in the vector space say another vector space say, I mean sorry the tensor space uh, vector space is C. So that is basically like uh, how we can say like uh, two vector spaces. Okay, I'll explain again. So two vector spaces A and B, uh, they undergo the tensor product, and then they give us a new vector space on which each elements of A and B are mapped one to one with the elements of the new vector space. So that is essentially the uh, meaning of a tensor product. So I think Kugar had also explained well in his section. So let's consider the <coughs> new uh, vector uh, uh, the vector space say, uh, that is arise due to the tensor product of a and B. So SAB is equals to SA uh, times SB. So the one thing about, uh, say, the tensor product is that the two vector spaces that we are taking in color, they can be of any nature. They need not of the similar uh, properties, or uh, you know, they don't need not have any uh, sort of correlate correlation. Between they can be any two vector spaces with any two properties. So we can say, uh, say a system. So system A uh, gets that's S A. So is based on you know rolling a dice, and then you have a system B that is based on tossing a coin. So if my operator sigma acts on the system, and then so which get, which uh, sigma will uh, acts on the system and give me a specific out uh, uh, about uh, the new uh, new space. So it gives me so I uh, have heads and tails, so that is due to uh, tossing a coin, and then I have one, two, three, four, five, six. That is the uh, all possible outcomes uh, by tossing a coin, by rolling a dice. Sorry. So you have so you have all these possibilities. That is H one. That means I need to get tails. I mean I need to get heads, and while also rolling one at the dice. 
So these are all the set of possibilities I get by uh, doing the product of these two uh, special, these two systems. So uh, next slide, Pugar. Yeah. So again, the tensor product uh, in the in the above uh, case is at twelve dimensions. As we see, there are twelve different possibilities. There are twelve dimension. Uh, there are twelve tensor. I mean, above space is twelve dimensional. So if I have to say about the super since any uh, you know state or any uh, function need to be able to be expressed in terms of a superposition of in terms of the basis vectors. So that is one uh, important property of uh, this uh, for a, uh, state or a space in mechanics. So a superposition of these two basis vectors is nothing but say a ket of h, and then you have a ket of four because these are the two different states in two different uh, systems, right? So if I do a tensor product, I just get it's just represented as the ket of h four, and then if I had to represent it in terms of a superposition in in terms of the basis vectors, and then I have alpha h three uh, of you know the ket of h3 and then alpha t4 the ket of so you can see here so even the superposition even the uh, even <coughs> sorry you know superposition vectors also take up the uh, uh, indu uh, the value the kind of the properties of the new tensor space and not the individual uh, individual vector spaces that they were uh, uh, formally present as so in this case the first half of it describes the state of the coin. <coughs> Sorry. And the second half uh, describes the state of the die. So the first half in the vector space is nothing but h. So it depends uh, uh, and t in the, in the combination of in the superposition state. So you have h and then t. So the first half uh, describes the uh, uh, describes the state level of the uh, of the state of the coin. And then the second half describes the state of the die, that is three or four. Uh, and next one, Pugar. So uh, that is a little, uh, you know, intro uh, intro into the ten, uh, tensor product and about the vector spaces. And so let's consider another set of systems, uh, penny and a dime, say A and B. So again, uh, the sigma is the operator acting on the system. So to give the output, uh, so what happens is, say the uh, so sigma acting on a penny gives me plus one, and then sigma acting on a dime gives me minus one. So say there are two people really far away, and uh, another person, uh, say A and B, are the subjects that are going to be taking the penny and the dime. And then the person C is the one who randomly gives the penny and the dime to the uh, specific people. So <clears throat> uh, after they get their specific penny or dime, A and B starts to observe what they had got. So what they've gotten. So after observing, they come back and they give it to the, the person who initially gave it to them. And then the person who gave it to them analyzes the, uh, ex, uh, you know, see, uh, analyzes the result uh, that oh, whether the A had gotten penny or dime or B had gotten penny or dime. And then he tries to come up with the result. So the expectation or the average value of the, uh, you know, of the results of that A had gotten, that is either a penny or a dime, tends to be zero because there is 50 50 chance and then uh, each time they get a penny or die it just can so we can say that uh, the result of the operator acting or the operator gives us the the information about the system after the experiment is being conducted so <clears throat> after that we find out that uh, the result is uh, the average result for both the systems tend to be zero but the product of the uh, since we are doing we are concerned about the tensor product so we need to take the product of the two uh, two uh, vector states so if we take the the whole expectation value the average value of the two vector states uh, put together we can see that it is minus one because we uh, it's either one and then it's minus one for a pain so if i try to uh, you know take the product of the cartesian product of that i tend to get minus one only so every time i just get minus one so the average value tends to be minus one for the product of the two states. So we can see here that uh, the uh, average value of the product of the initial vector states is not equal to the individual product of the uh, vector states. So this is a statistical correlation as to how the <coughs> tensor product and the vector spaces work. So next, next slide, Pugur. 
and now uh, this is the about two examples were just in order to give an idea about how the uh, results and how how we uh, how the experiments are being conducted and how the results we get and to draw a, a kind of a broad line conclusion about what it actually is so now let's get into our uh, quantum mechanical so so there are two systems a and b and then let uh, the spin off system a be uh, sigma and then the spin off system b be uh, tau so our basis for the system since uh, so we have uh, as i mentioned before the pairs of spin are up and down uh, uh, right and left and then uh, inside and outside so these are the three different spin pairs in all the three dia three uh, axes so i am trying to uh, so what we are trying to do here is uh, express the uh, spins based on uh, one set of uh, what do you call the ba uh, basis vectors so the basis vectors again since we are dealing with the tensor product we do the uh, product of these two uh, vector states and then we come up with a, a basis vector that is the ket of uh, uu that is <coughs> sorry uh, up uh, that is up and up and then up and down and then down and up and then down and down so these are my new basis for the uh, new vector space that is uh, that i have got from a tensor product of two individual vector spaces so if i have the sigma vector operator that is spin operator that is <coughs> spin vector sorry uh, that is sigma acting on the uh, basis u and u so uh, what is initial uh, what is to uh, actually I'll, I'll tell the results as to like what is the conclusion of uh, showing all of these equations so if you if my sigma acts on u and u gives me uh, the uh, ket of u u so again if sigma acts on ket u d it gives me u d. so if sigma acts on ket d u it gives me minus d u sigma acts on uh, ket d d it gives me minus d what since uh, one important property uh, we can you know sort of understand about the operators that are acting on a uh, a combined space is that the initial <coughs> uh, the uh, vector that uh, it, that uh, you know it belongs to the uh, to uh, the uh, one system say system a since sigma is system a we can see that the sigma only uh, looks onto the uh, information that is available in the uh, in only the one uh, it's half of the vector space so since it's half of the vector space is denoted in the first half right so since the fir the first u is uh, is the uh, <coughs> is the uh, state in the uh, that belongs to the first uh, system that is a so and then uh, we can see the sigma of u gives me just u and then sigma of d since it is uh, down so it gives me minus 1 so basically sigma of initially my sigma of u gives me plus 1 uh, times sigma is times u and then sigma of d gives me minus one times d. so this is how uh, we can say that the uh, operate or the other vectors acting on the uh, i mean uh, vectors in times the uh, uh, basis vectors just gives me uh, just depends on the half of its uh, uh, half of half of its system and doesn't alter the uh, value that is present in the other half of the system it just uh, acts on its half that it was initially present in so that is uh, the conclusion we can draw from here so it should give you a slight understanding about or the or you can also say that is a slight problem that is present in quantum entanglement in this case because we can say that if any operator is uh, you know is being acted on a specific state it just gives an imp information about one specific thing and uh, it doesn't uh, matter what is present in the uh, vector space so we, what we can say here is that uh, <clears throat> the uh, entangled state or the entangled system as such it uh, doesn't uh, give us an exact idea about uh, the two individual systems as such but gives us only an idea combined system so my my d uh, so my uh, the other half could be u or d right so from the other half of the so but my result doesn't matter, doesn't depend on what the other second half is so my result only depends on whether the uh, if the uh, operator that belongs to the first system acts on or not so we can say that it doesn't give us an overall idea as to the initial independent i mean 
the uh, indep uh, independent components of the uh, system, but only gives us the uh, result for the overall uh, vector space that is uh, that is formed by doing the tensor product of two vectors. So next slide, Pugal. Yeah. So product states. So this is uh, uh, what you say. Like uh, you have the component that is alpha u that belongs to uh, basis of uh, that acts on the basis, and then you have alpha d acting. On D, and then you have beta u acting on basis u and then beta d acting on basis d so alpha is the uh, you know alpha is also is uh, is the uh, vector that is uh, that belongs to the first uh, vector space and then beta is a vector that is that belongs to the second uh, vector space so if i do the product of these two or the tensor product of these states i get a combine i get equation number 35 that uh, is basically alpha u b, uh, beta u of u u and alpha u of ket d u and uh, beta u alpha sorry it should be alpha d not, and here it should be sorry it's a uh, beta u alpha d uh, of ket u d and beta d alpha u of ket d so uh, this is how the uh, tens uh, tensor product of two different uh, states work and <coughs> So the maximal entangled state or the singlet state. So the um, the uh, the in, in entanglement that is not entangled. It's just uh, it it can also mean that a system one system is more entangled than the other. So uh, the most entangled system state for a system can be given as like say a singlet. So it's called as a singlet state. So, uh, singlet, uh, the ket of singlet can be given as 1 by root 2 of uh, ket of ud minus ket of du. So, <clears throat> we have already, uh, I think we have already come across as to how, why constant 1 by root 2 is given there. It is part of this. Uh, and so, the singlet uh, cannot be written as a product state as we can see. So, next uh, slide. All right, uh, and then the other maximally entangled. So I will explain to you later. I have, uh, you know, separated the singlet state from these other three entangled, uh, entangled, entangled states, or called as the triplet. So these, uh, I'll tell you as to why I have separated those two. So other three are basically the other two different, uh, three different combinations of the. Uh, you know the product spaces so one more and uh, i think it was all done so i'll just go on with it so the spin polarization principle uh, the uh, spin polarization uh, polarization principle it states that uh, there is some direction at which the spin is plus one so plus one in the sense in our case if it is the up direction along the z axis so at if if it has to it if some at some uh, direction it has to be plus one so as we have seen our average our values of sigma was uh, zero right initially but then our spin uh, spin polarization principle says that at one point it should be uh, plus one so uh, what it uh, so uh, this some of the squares of the uh, average values of the spin along each direction uh, should be equal to one that is what it tells us so we, it tells us that the uh, not all expectation values can be zero, but there is an anomaly here. So that's why uh, that's the problem with entanglement. And this is also one of the reasons why I presented it so much, despite uh, knowing that it exists. So next slide, Pugat. Yeah, so the fact uh, continues to hold for product states. So uh, the singlet as well as the triplet product states. However, for the entangled state, uh, that is the singlet state, the right hand side would be uh, one. What we have seen is by root two of ket of u d minus ket of du. So for sigma, uh, for the average value, of, so along the basis of the singlet, so <coughs> uh, ket, and then uh, we are uh, taking the uh, basis to be singlet. So we are have uh, the singlet uh, acting on uh, singlet part and the, uh, sigma z and then sigma uh, sing. Sorry, singlet ket, and then uh, this uh, we we know the we know uh, value of sigma z acting the ket uh, singlet. So we have uh, 
the brassiclet times uh, 1 by root 2 times sigma z of u d uh, cat u d minus cat d u. So if I, I do the product, uh, so uh, we have also seen that there are two pro different products eh, from the triplet. So <clears throat> I have 1 by root 2 times sigma z u d plus uh, uh, cat of d u. So my uh, sigma z would be half of, again, uh, u d minus d u times u d plus d u. So which is zero. So similarly for all the other uh, spin, uh, uh, spin vectors, that is the average value just tends to be zero. So this is an anomaly because if I just do the square and sum, still it should give me zero, but it doesn't uh, give me so. So this is why we can say that, uh, you know, uh, tensor, just the tensor, uh, we can not express the entangles in terms of tensor product. So uh, any st any uh, states which ca which cannot be uh, you know expressed as a tensor product is basically entangled state. And one key thing to take away from this is that the entangled state only gives you information. Uh, what Pugard has said that the state vector should give you all the uh, information, like the ket psi uh, of the wave function should be give you all the information about the system as such. So, but in this case, we can see that. <coughs> Uh, if I take the ket of say sigma uh, u d or d u, so it doesn't give me the information about the uh, individual systems, but it only gives me the information about the combined system. So that 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 actually is again another uh, anomaly because it has to give me the information about the uh, individual systems and also give me information about the uh, product or the combined system, but it doesn't do so because uh, there is again another uh, sort of uh, you know uh, what do you say uncertainty in uh, the uh, values uh, when an uh, when an uh, when an operator is acting on a specific uh, uh, state. Uh, it it uh, there because as we have seen, I have told that if the operator says sigma x acts on u u. So it just gives me u uh, u u, or if I uh, in that case, what happens is it only acts on the it, it's part of the vector space and doesn't matter, doesn't really uh, bother about the other half that is present in the vector space. So the other half of the vector space can basically be take its other two values that is you know plus or minus one depending on the direction. So that is still an amount that is still a point of uh, you know uh, uncertainty that is present in the uh, individual systems, but in the combined system we can get a specific amount specific uh, you know value when we try to uh, use an operator to get a result from it and the reason why uh, i have separated the singlet from all of the other three triplets is that when i try to evaluate uh, the uh, calculate the eigen value with respect to the singlet basis i get a value that is uh, you know i get a specific um, specific single valued eigen value but in if as you can see from here if I try to uh, take the uh, <coughs> obtain the eigenvalue in the base in with the basis of the other three triplet states, we can see that it can have uh, different degenerate values. So that is the reason why those three uh, triplet state is differentiated from the maximally entangled singlet state. So that is all about entanglement. So I think I'll stop with my talk. Any questions or any part? I know rush through some topics or I wasn't clear in some part, but if you have any doubts or any queries, you can. Uh... Uh, hmm? Hello. I said we'll save it for the end. Okay, okay, fine. All right. Uh, with that, I would just add two things to conclude. With all that's being said, there's still some trouble in quantum mechanics. Uh, you know, the wave function that we saw, is that uh, a calculative device or does it actually exist? And what does it mean if it does exist? Um, why is measurement distinct from time evolution? So measurement is stochastic, measurement is random. Time evolution is deterministic. Why does this different arise? What is the nature of uh, measurement? Because 
usually when we're talking about measurement, the word that's used in most textbooks, introductory books, is collapse. And what happens in this collapse is energy conserved during this collapse. So, you know, we truly don't understand that. Um, and with respect to locality, uh, the, the idea is that, uh, you know, you can have some non-local uh, modes of uh, things, especially these correlations that Mukun showed you. Uh, these correlations uh, ca are only possible if information transfer is, is in some case superluminal or there are certain interpretations that it doesn't need to be superluminal. So, uh, are these non-local effects first of all true? Are they present in quantum mechanics? And, you know, if they are, are they just artifacts of our ignorance or are they real? You know, these three are three central questions that are open in the community right now. Nobody knows the answer to them. Work is still in progress. And we will attempt to review this and uh, potential interpretations that, you know, can solve this, formulations that can solve this. Those are, those are the, the, that's the work in the upcoming few weeks. And uh, in, in fact, uh, to give you a preview, this was a survey conducted a few years ago of what's your favorite uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics. And you can see that there's absolutely almost no consensus. Uh, you know, Copenhagen is 42%, but obviously it falls for so many plot holes. So, full of plot holes. So, um, the, you can see that the community by itself is confused and they, there's, uh, there's no singular uh, formulation. And when we're talking about formulation, this was done, this is actually done in 2007, I think. And right now we have a few more formulations in the field. Uh, so, so the new ones are sometimes called super deterministic theories and these theories assert that quantum mechanics is in fact actually deterministic. Um, and uh, some people like Hooft who won a Nobel uh, for uh, you know, pro proving that QFTs are finite, uh, he is working on it and some interesting people are working on this, these ideas, uh, but we're still in a lot of confusion. And um, in fact, when I told you earlier uh, that, you know, some, there are some ideas that even these real numbers are not observable, what I meant was these real numbers, these ideas from a guy called Jason, a uh, very important uh, idea in my opinion, uh, I will link in the paper. Uh, the idea is that these real numbers, uh, they, in theory, real numbers have infinite number of decimals. But in practice, we do not uh, do that. We just round them off. Uh, and this is because to store an infinite uh, decimal number, you would take infinite, uh, uh, the amount of information required is infinite and that's not possible given the fact that the, uh, the information in our universe itself is finite. And the idea that Jason proposes that, you know, even classical mechanics uh, must be uh, non-deterministic is because, uh, you know, if you're only talking about five decimal places, what happens if the six decimal place suddenly comes in and flips the value of the number? That introduces some level of indeterminacy. Is another idea that's being thrown around. And th this, this work that I'm talking about is like 2019, 2020 stuff. Like, it's happening as we speak. And uh, the, the good thing, the, the thing that we're lucky is that there are more and more ways of constraining current models uh, you can so you know you can experimentally verify if super determinism or uh, this is something called consistent histories model which one of these would actually be ruled out and these are all things that are happening right now you can just uh, uh, the published date of this thing was I think in August 2020 so as you can see so we will be going over this in the next couple of weeks and uh, we hope that this would be an interesting journey to follow. All right. Um, thank you, guys. And now we can open the room for questions.